courtesy of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the great win streak of 2024 has come to an end, and uh, I'm Dan alongside Matt, as always, to discuss everything going on with the Flames. Matt, you were right. They beat Chicago. They lost to Seattle. I know. I actually was right in the weekly predictions for, what, probably the only time this year. We'll see. It's still early in the year. We've only done two weeks. Um, hopefully, hopefully you'll get more than, than just the one, but I guess we will find out as we move forward. Let's jump into the first game of the week. The Calgary Flames took on Chicago Blackhawks here in the Dome. This is the first time Connor Bedard has been uh, in the Dome. I think the first time he's even played against the Flames as an NHLer because he was hurt for a bit last year. But either way, it didn't matter. The Calgary Flames ended up winning 3-1 to one against Chicago Blackhawks. Um, good game here. We saw, uh, I think probably the biggest, uh, the biggest story coming out of this one for me, for the flames was the fact that we saw Coronado's first multi-point NHL game. He got, uh, two goals in this one. What'd you think of this game? I thought that this was more of how a team should play against a bad team. Um, normally the flames throughout their, well, the last decade plus, yeah, it's like, oh, we should beat these guys handily, lose five to one. And, you know, it, the last handful of years, we've lost many games to Chicago uh, and Columbus and, you know, insert bad teams here. Um, and I thought Calgary managed any push that the Blackhawks had in the game. And uh, they didn't do anything to be risky uh, because they didn't need to. Like once they got the lead, they didn't, uh, you know, make any startlingly bad decisions with the puck. It was just kind of coast through the the time clock and count it down until the empty netter, and that's about it. Yeah. No, it was. I mean, like you said, it was a simple game. I think the Flames played. They knew how they had to play this one, and they went out and did it. Yeah, And, you know, like I said, we got uh, two goals from Coronado. We got a goal from Huberto in this one. His point streak continues. Matt, do you think it's fair to say this is probably the best NHL game we've seen from Matthew Coronado? Uh, yeah, I would uh, say, especially with him playing on the fourth line to get a pair of goals, especially the empty netter uh, was a good effort uh, to break away from Bedard uh, to seal it off. And even uh, fighting in front of the net to jam the puck in on the first goal for the Flames. Um, uh, We've both uh, said that, like, Coronado needs to uh, show more willingness to get into the correct areas to score. And uh, we saw that in this game. We did, yeah. He he looked like a guy who belongs in the NHL here, and that's... I mean, we all like him and we all have seen development, but I think you and I both agreed that, yeah, he needed to do a little bit more to stick around. And in this game, he looked like an NHLer. Yeah, and then, you know, development is not a linear process. And, you know, we saw with Coronado last year, he was great in the AHL, looked like a, you know, budding superstar, got to the NHL and looked kind of lost for the majority of the season. And, you know, he's made some adjustments and, you know, he's starting to look more like the AHL guy in the NHL, uh, which if that carries on, is, bodes very well for him and the Flames. Yeah, it sure does. And let's talk about uh, the next game then, I guess, where he was also featured. This time he got a more prominent role. Uh, Matt Coronado on the first line with Nazem Kadri and Andre Kuzmenko in this game as Calgary went to Seattle trying to get five wins in a row to start their season, which would have been a franchise record all the way back through Atlanta. They've never done that. And they've also, until this game, never lost in Seattle. So um, both those things come to an end, their win streak and their unbeaten streak in Seattle as the Flames end up dropping this one 2-1 to one in overtime to the uh, Seattle Kraken. And they had a three-day break before this game. I thought the team looked tired. They looked uninterested. I don't know, maybe they just assume they were going to win this or they just need, you know, sometimes when you do something so often, you stay in a routine and when you get out of it, it's like working out or anything. You, It's harder to get back into it. I don't know if that's what happened with the Flames, but they didn't look like the team that we'd seen in the last four games here, in my opinion. 
No, and in the first four games, like the Flames had had stretches of the game where they were a little sloppy and disorganized, but were able to pull it together, um, especially in the second and third periods as those games went along. And um, it with the Seattle game, uh, it looked fairly disorganized f- from both sides. Uh, you know, like it... It, the majority of the game was in the neutral zone. Um, like with the last few minutes of the game, like the shots were like 20 to 16 uh, with like, I think it was like four minutes left. And it's like, normally that's what you have like in the middle of the hockey game, not, you know, with like four minutes left to go in regulation. And, it reminded um, me of when teams used to play against Minnesota and they'd play that sort of trap style that they used to play and there was just not a lot of offense. Yeah, it's like both teams would streak out through the neutral zone, turn it over at the blue line, then streak up the other way, turn it over at the blue line, and just, you know, back and forth the whole game. Yeah, I mean, and this was said on the, you know, on the radio broadcast afterwards, but it looked like I thought that Seattle was playing a road game at home. They were playing a very simple game. They were playing a game that, you know, um, that I think they knew how to play. And in some ways, I think that they ended up making the Flames play their game and getting the Flames off of what they'd been doing for the last four. Yeah, and, you know, Calgary was very disorganized, I felt, throughout the contest. Um, and it, even like the lines that had proven chemistry, everything seemed a little off. Like the Pospisil Huberto Mantle line was not very noticeable. Um, the Cadre line was not very good. Um, it, it, it the fourth line was uh borderline terrible to the point where it actually got benched for the last bit of the. Uh, third period and overtime because like they That's they weren't Lombard, doing, Kirkland Cla- Klapka line. Yeah, uh, like they none of them were playing effectively, so you know, it, it's hard to overcome things when you know so many parts of the team are just not in sync. Marimanov was out for this one and Barry slotted into the lineup in his place. I think you're going to see that when guys aren't looking fantastic. And I don't think that Marimanov has looked fantastic. I mean, I don't expect him to, but um, I think you'll see that defense rotating in and out with eight bodies. They want to get everybody on the ice. Matt, I think this was probably, though, the first time the Flames really maybe faced some adversity here. Like you said, the fourth line getting benched, guys not looking interested. Um, and, and I think this is because of that, probably the best game for them to build on going in next week. Say, okay, this is what happens when we're not interested. How do we get, get through that and get past that? Yeah. And you know, like you could see certain guys like trying a little bit too hard to force plays because, you know, like they're getting frustrated, um, with how things were and, um, that's where like certain mistakes like the cadre turnover and overtime happen. And, you know, it just lots of little things where, you know, if things were working more cohesively throughout the contest, like mistakes like that don't normally happen. Uh, but when I saw the, a lot of people online and even during the call in show on the radio last night talking about because of what cadre did in overtime, he therefore doesn't want to be here. Like, Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody try, you know, and I think Kadri, like you said, was just trying hard to do something and maybe tried too hard. This has nothing to do with him not want to be here. It's because he couldn't score in overtime. No, it just, things happen. And I mean, if anything, if you don't want to be here, you end up scoring overtime. So do you look more valuable to get traded? Exactly. Yeah. I'm just hoping that some people that had drunk too much during the game and it's like, come on guys, this is silly. Yes, Exactly. But one thing that's not silly is where the Flames are in the standings. They have nine of a possible ten points right now after five games. They're 4-0-1 with nine points. And actually, yeah, actually, that is the best start in the franchise history. The other two times that the Flames won four in a row, they lost uh, the fifth game in regulation. So um, we actually getting a point there actually makes this the best start in franchise history. Yeah, I mean, it's (laughs) it's amazing what they've done. And they're 
Flames are tied for second in the West right now. Dallas has 10 points, and they're tied with Utah, not the team I would expect to be tied with. So good to see. And hopefully, you know, down the road, we know this team will struggle at some point. I mean, every team struggles at some point. And I think the Flames are, you know, will have their share of struggles. Hopefully later on, you know, when they start struggle, mm-hmm. these um, these points can that they've got early can help them out. I mean, remember what was it last year? There was a couple points out of the playoffs. Like if they get those early points, I think that that could be the difference between postseason or not. Well, uh, I was... Uh reading that uh for about two and a half months last season the flames were actually playing at a 104 point pace um basically the time after they started trading off guys like lindholm and beyond like they actually started playing significantly better so um you know like this team might actually be better than what you know everybody would expect because like the those big distractions from this room are now on other teams and you know like everybody's kind of pulling in the same direction yeah and even craig conroy i forget who the interview is with but he said to one of the hockey pundits this week um that he likes the quiet around this team that there's not all those outside distractions right now so i think they will probably try to keep that as much as for as long as they can before they make a move or do something like that. But you're right. I think everybody that's here now wants to be here, right? Guys like Mantha came in the off season because they want to be here. Lomberg came in the off season because they want to be here. I think you've got guys that want to be here. And so you can focus on creating a great room, creating a, ga- a great atmosphere for these guys and just playing hockey and wanting to play together. And it, it shows like how much chemistry itself matters to a team. And yeah, where you know, it, you remove a, f- a few people who don't want to actually buy in with this team and it lifts the sales of everybody else who actually does. Yeah, and I mean, if if any of our fans have been watching The Chase, the Flames video series they've been putting out sort of about training camp, you can see in the room, like there's some very vocal guys this year. It seems that they're all pretty close this year. So I think the chemistry, but I would say also that maybe camaraderie, right? Just knowing we're all here and we all want to do this. Not that somebody's not wanting to be here. Somebody's, you know, kind of upset to be here. I think there's just that, okay, let's do this together. And it's silly to say, but let's be a team. And I think that's really important. Mm-hmm. One of the one of the things I think has been a standout for this flame so far has been their goaltending. And we've seen both Dan Vladar and Dustin Wolf use. They've been switching off pretty much every other. What are your thoughts on each goalie this far? Uh, I thought that Vladar struggled uh, in the first game, um, in the first period. And after that, he has been stellar uh, for the Flames. And Wolf has been stellar in both of his starts. Um there's nothing at all to complain about with how they're playing. If they keep going like this all season, like the Flames will make the playoffs. Like the caliber of goaltending they're getting, like it, it will be hard to beat this team enough for this team to miss the playoffs. I agree, and I, I guess my intangible is I don't know. I don't know how durable Dan Vladar is right now. I mean, he's coming off a big injury. I don't know if we're seeing the best of him now and then he gets hurt around Christmas again or, you know, the injury catches up with him. I don't have that information. I don't think anybody does. Um, But I think if they can both play at this pace, yeah, they could definitely play themselves into a postseason berth. And I like the fact that they're rotating goalies. And I think they'll probably continue to do that. Like, I don't think you'll have a starter I don't think you'll have a backup. I think you just run, you know, roll them every other almost as they have been so far and give both guys the chance to establish themselves. Cause you and I have talked about in the past, Dan Vladar has played less than a hundred NHL games. Like we don't even know what we have out of him. And this is first time really being a starter and, you know, playing those starter minutes and getting, you know, that starter prep and that sort of thing. So I think, You know, we look at guys like David Riddick, who I think was a good backup that got thrust into a starter role and didn't do well in that spot. There's some guys that are just better backups. And I think this is really that chance to see, okay, can Dan Vladar take the next step? And also, is Dustin Wolf able to do what we've seen him do in two other leagues at the NHL level? And I think he's had some shaky play. I mean, every goaltender does. But I'm liking what I see from both guys so far. And I, 
I think it's going to be really tough to get Devin Cooley some play time if these guys keep playing the way they are. Yeah, and realistically, with uh, the injury concerns that you mentioned and uh, the lack of familiarity with the NHL on Wolf's part, the ability to and the flexibility to have each guy switch off um, and basically playing every fourth day instead of every other day, um, like that helps. Gotta keep them fresh. Exactly, because it gives them basically a recover day, then a practice day, then the day before the game, and then the game. And like they don't need to be like okay ready to go the very like day after type of thing and uh, you know especially with uh the unknown status of ladar's hip um you know it it makes sense to spell him as much as possible so that way he can regain the strength in it so that way you know both for now and his long-term health uh you know it I think that's the best way to go. And I think for both young goalies, not only, like you were saying, the rest between them, but also that time to go through video and watch what you've done and watch your next team. And, you know, I think that's going to give them a lot of time for off-ice development too, which is something that a lot of times fans forget about, that there's a lot of off-ice stuff that goes on there. Matt, I want to throw something out to you. Um, Dan Vladar is in the last year of his two-year deal. He's making $2.2 million. If he keeps playing like this, what do you think the chance is that he's not a flame at the trade deadline? Um, it depends on where the flames are at. Like if they're basically where they were ish last year, um, and where like they'd have to win six or seven starting then to make the playoffs, um, you might see him get traded, but. Goalies don't generally return a ton at the trade deadline, and Vladar is kind of an unknown quantity, where, like, Markstrom last year was a known quantity, and, like, we saw what we he returned. We just know that Conroy's going to say he doesn't want to lose assets for nothing. No, and to me, like, I would not mind if the Flames re-signed Vladar for, like, three or four years at, like, four to five million. Um, because like if he plays well enough where like he earns that contract, he will be a tradable asset. Like when Wolf uh, establishes himself more as the go-to guy and yeah. Yeah. And and I think anywhere he would go in the off season, he'd be in a similar scenario. There's not going to be anywhere he's going to go where he's going to be a one. I think when I look at the potential markets, potentially for Dan Vladar, I'm thinking he's still going to be a 1A, 1B type guy. So why do that in, you know, another market when you can do it here where you're familiar? Yep. And, you know, like this team is growing together. So, you know, you're wanting to, you know, better to go with what you know instead of, you know, somewhere else just because. What do you you think fair money for Dan Vladar is in a renewal? uh, Provided he plays like as he has it both in the past and like thus far this season uh, in the neighborhood of like four and a half, five million Um, sort of like the contract that uh, Decord signed with Seattle actually Um, not that long ago. So yeah, Yeah. reasonable. Yeah. I mean the flames have the money to do it. Yeah. Reasonable average starter money, like not high or low. Just yeah. I don't, I couldn't, I don't think I could justify paying him more than double what he is now. Like, you know, he's getting two, two, let's call that four or five, double it. I think about four seems like a reasonable, if you were to give him four and Wolf four, give him the exact same contract, say you're, you know, one, a one B, we're going to give you guys both four for three. See who can earn big money after that. Yeah. And that I mean, might be exactly the way that they look at it. Like uh, next year, Wolf's uh, first contract is, up um that he just resigned with um yeah so you know like and i they, wouldn't be surprised if there's some strategy there by the flames and wolf's agent to say well we don't want to resign until we know what you know dan Blard's getting so let's you know let's go in negotiation same time mm-hmm. yep i could totally see that happening 
Well, Matt, um, I think we've talked about most of the actual Flames news this week. Should we talk a little bit about the Wranglers? Yes. I think the Wranglers are a little bit forgotten by fans this this year because everyone's looking at the young players on the Flames. And I mean, I was having a discussion on Twitter with a fan about the Wranglers and he was saying, oh, you know, why don't they bring up Hunter Brustavich and all this? Like, if you guys want to see Brustavich and, you know, Grishnikov and all these guys, remember, they're here. Like, they're in Calgary now, but you need... You need that AHL to develop because not everybody can be in the NHL. Not everybody's ready for the NHL. A lot of times it's better to have guys play top-line AHL than it is, you know, third or fourth-line NHL. So um, the the Wranglers have been looking pretty good. They lost their home opener. They've won since. We've had some milestones there. Matt Hearson, I never thought I'd say Walker Dewar scores a hat trick against the Silver Knights. That's not the guy, if you were to ask me, who's going to score a hat trick? You can tell that, like, he's also saying, hey, I, I'm i still here. I exist. That's right. You know. Pick me, pick me. Don't forget about me. Don't forget about me. You know, and I mean, Walker Dewar was a college free agent. We don't see a lot of those pan out, right? I mean, Josh Juris comes to mind, guys like that. I think, honestly, Walker Dewar could be a very, uh, decent to very good AHLer for a number of years. And from what I've seen, it looks like, you know, he is where he needs to be this year. Yeah. Could he bounce back and be what he was his first stint in the Flames? Yes. But in a similar way that like Peltier has to reestablish himself at the AHL level, Dewar has to like have a good half to full season of, you know, being like a top player in the A in order to potentially earn his way back up. To I feel the fourth like liner. for Dewar, he's been pushed down the depth chart a little bit. So even if he has a good year, I think there's other guys that are probably going to get the look or get the nod before him. It's kind of like, well, you had your chance. You, you know, didn't do what we need you to do. So, um, you know, time to move on. Yep. You know, I mean, even Justin Kirkland, not a guy I would expect to have got a look from the team this year, but a guy who, you know, we're seeing and, and looking very good. But I think sometimes you've got to give those looks to the new guys or the guys that have, you know, that are higher on the depth chart before you, you re-give them to somebody. But uh, another milestone, Devin Cooley gets his first shutout against the Silver Knights, his first career professional shutout, which is awesome. He's... I've seen a little bit of what he's doing down there. I, I got a Flow Hockey subscription. Um, if if fans don't have that, check it out. Flow Hockey lets you watch pretty much all the professional leagues, AHL, ECHL, SPHL, some college stuff. It's a great way to consume hockey for one price and one app, which is always good instead of you know needing to have six or seven apps and subscriptions. So I've watched a little bit. Cooley's looking good. And this is a guy that I think, you know, it's going to be interesting because if they do re-sign, as we were talking about both Ladar and Wolf, I think Cooley's going to be saying, well, I am i don't want to be bound for the AHL. So I think you're really going to have to find a way to move one of those goalies at some point. Yeah, and it, it really just depends on the play level of everybody. And, you know, like if, you know, Ladar plays so well that you, you know, it would be stupid to trade, you know, and do anything other than sign him then you know that kind of forces your hand and it's kind of like too bad for you cool good problem like you know um but we have better options and yeah but that's what i mean though i mean if you're Devin cooley you're probably not i think he's got a two year so you'll be you know you're bound here for two years but if he keeps going like this i think he could force their hand to make that trade and and that's probably a good thing yep so, Matt, there's three Wranglers players right now who all have eight points, which is leading the league. Um, and those three guys, we talked about one already. Walker Dewar has five goals and three assists. Rory Cairns, who's kind of come out of nowhere. If you remember, first year pro, he spent the whole year in the ECHL with Rapid City. Last year, he went to the AHL. He looked okay. This year, he's got seven goals and one assist. He's looked dynamic. And Peltier, who's got zero goals and eight assists so far. So those are the three uh, top Wranglers right now. I'm not surprised about Peltier. I'm a little bit surprised that Rory Cairns is coming out as hard as he is. I don't know what the upside of that guy is, but um, you know, from what I saw, I, I watched part of that uh, that last game. Peltier is looking like he's really pushing for that NHL job. Yep, and Cairns, he has a really good shot. Um, he's a little bit undersized, but 
you know, if he can translate that shot to the NHL, he does have a shot at being an NHL player. And like, if he plays like this, uh, for half the year, he will get a shot at some point. The in his, yeah. in his first year pro, I saw some of what he did in rapid city in the ECHL and he didn't have great hockey sense. Like he looked like he was often confused. He looked like he didn't know where he's supposed to be at the time. I think he was kind of relying on that shot and just guys getting him that puck. So I think, you know, we're seeing him develop into an all around hockey player and that's what you have to be. If you're going to make it out of the minor leagues. Yeah, because last year he had 16 goals and 16 assists in 54 games, which is like standard-ish, um, you know, middle six AHL scoring levels. Like uh, usually, that's like kind anybody, of the numbers you expect for a guy who will make the NHL at some point. Yeah, like you would expect like a guy that's like imminently ready for the NHL to be more at like a point per game pace, give or take. Um, so, you know, like he wasn't that good last year, but he certainly is showing that thus far this season. Uh, just have to wait and see. I think Rory Kearns could end up being the next um, Postol or Zari where they're not the top guy in the depth chart, but they get a shot and they earn their way in. Mm-hmm. Yep. And you know, that's, I, I don't. You know, and we see this all the time that where you have random like late round picks that turn into found money. It does happen. So, you know, it's one of those things that might this be one of those times could be, uh, just have to wait and see though. According to elite prospects based on his numbers so far this year, eight points in five games, they're predicting 115 points in 72 games for him. I don't think that's reasonable, but it's nice to think about. Mm Mm-hmm. It's like Jonathan Huberto getting 200 points. Yep. Not reasonable, but that's neat. So good good to see the Wranglers doing well. And, you know, again, I encourage fans who are excited by the rebuild, who are excited by the future, watch the Wranglers, watch them online, go to a game. The games are cheap. But remember that, you know, uh, there's great players down there and guys like Verstavich and, you know, Cairns and Peltier and let's put Dewar in there. You know, they are where they need to be right now. And development sometimes is a slow process. As Matt said earlier, it's not always, you know, linear. So if you want to see these guys, go watch them. Like, it's a fun night, a fun afternoon, depending on when you go, at the rink to watch the Wranglers. They put on a great show, and it's fun to to sort of get that investment in these guys now. And you can say, oh, I saw them in their first year pro with Brustavich or, you know, things like that. So, I'd encourage people to to do what they can to view the Wranglers, no matter what that looks like to you. And just remember that you don't have to be, If it doesn't mean that if you're not with the Flames, you're not good. Um, the Wranglers have been a great team since they moved here, and I think that they're really trying to make sure they still are and still be competitive. Yep. And, it, you know, it's nice to see that um, the Flames are focusing on both the youth aspect it with the Wranglers, but also having some more veteran guys like Dewar there um, to make the team competitive as well. So that way, well, you know, I mean, like Dewar's not- kind of a medium veteran. You've got guys like Martin Furk and Tenorti who are like grizzled veteran status. True, uh, but it, you know, like they're not guy like gonna get their heads st- shoveled in every game and be like the you know bottom five in the league type of thing. Like they're a reasonably built AHL team that should be a playoff team. Yeah, and sometimes you know, again, it's better to have playoff hockey in the AHL than you know, golfing in May in the NHL. So I think that there's definitely, I think fans have to remember that there's a place for the AHL in these guys' development. And, you know, you don't have to just come to the NHL or bust. Like, you know, I think in a lot of cases, and we've had this discussion about Sam Bennett. I won't have it again today, but I think Sam Bennett needed more AHL time. And I think fans have to remember that there is a place for that in their development. So for some of these guys, let them play in the AHL. Don't, you know, be so eager to rush them to the NHL. They need that AHL play time. And, so as the consistency of just having a whole season in the AHL, not going up and down and up and down can even benefit a player more. So just remember that that's part of the cycle. Matt, do you want to answer some fan questions? Definitely. 
We uh, we reached out to some fans. We asked fans this week, what do you want us to talk about on this week's show? Since we knew there wouldn't be a ton of Flames news, we got three really good questions. Let's start with one from Shane Conahan 17 That's at Shane Conahan 17 on Twitter, who asked, who has the higher ceiling, Matt Coronado or Sam Honzig? Do you want to give your thoughts on this first? It's a very interesting conversation because, or topic, because they're completely different types of players. Um, Coronado is more of your uh, elite sniper um, exclusively type guy, where Hanzig is more of your cerebral uh, two-way guy who can uh, chip in with either a good uh, goal here and there or a good pass here and there. Um, I, I view that Hanzig will be the more important player to the team, even though point wise and goal wise, Coronado might be the better player in terms of the counting stats. And that's fair. Yeah. I think when we talk about who has the higher end ceiling, I guess the matter of what are we looking at at that ceiling is that number of NHL games, that number of points, I think Hanzig is kind of being groomed to be the next Michael Backlund. I think when the captains either retires or leaves town, I think he can play that that role of being that two-way guy, that reliable player in every scenario. And I mean, Backlund's made a living here for 17 years in that role, right? I mean, you know, he's making good money. He's making over $5 million as a third-line third center, and he's very important to this team. And, does, you know, the fact that he's not a first-line guy, does that mean he didn't meet his potential? I don't know about that, you know, so I think it depends on how we define ceiling, but I think you're right. They're both different players. They're not going to be competing for the same spot in the lineup every year. They're going to have different spots in the lineup. I think Coronado is your scorer. I think that, um, that Hanzig is going to be more of that, that two way guy, that cerebral guy, the guy with a ton of finesse, but probably more of a setup man than the, than the guy who's popping him in. Yeah, to make a I mean, comparison to the former Flames, like uh, Coronado reminds me a lot of Mike Camilleri um, and how he plays just in general. And Sam Honzig, uh, I view as more of a tall version of Damon Lanko. Interesting. With probably Taller a better shot. Taller and less blonde. Yes. Um, yeah, no, I think that's fair. And Lankow was a good defensive forward as well. And, you know, he had some, he definitely had some, some offensive touch. He could be that offensive guy, but that's not why you were bringing him in. So I think, you know, I think, again, sort of like we we're talking about with the Wranglers, right? If some guys need seasoning, I think we have to remember too that it's not like if you're not the top scorer on a team, you haven't made it or you haven't made it to your potential. I mean, I don't think that's ever what they drafted Backlund for. You know, I don't I don't think that they, that's what they expected from him. And he was a high draft pick. So I guess it's a matter of, you know, how are we defining ceiling? I think both of them could be definitely good career NHLers and good long-term flames. But if we're looking at the score sheet, I think it's going to be Coronado. Mm-hmm. I, w- I would agree with that. I also think that. that, I also think that for the type of player Hanzig is, and this goes back to the Wranglers discussion earlier. I think he's the kind of guy you could see in the American League for longer. Like he's out week to week right now. I don't know he has a spot in the Flames lineup when Sharon Govich comes back. He's the kind of player I could see them wanting to play whole or partial seasons in the American League because I think it takes longer to build both those parts of a guy's game. So I think that'll frustrate some fans if that's true. But I think that you'll probably see him as a, a bit of a slower progression in the first couple of years. Yeah. And I, I would assume that like once he's healthy, that he just gets assigned to the A pretty much same day. Um, just because Sharon Govich will be back and due to roster compliance issues that, uh, you know, and he looked adequate uh, in his games here, but. You know, to get back up to speed after missing a few weeks, I, I think it would be better for him to start in the A again. And they got to say, we can't have Walker Dewar as our lead scorer. Let's send someone else down, right? Yes, exactly. So, and you know, I think there's also part of it that you've got to you want to play these guys with the guys they'll probably play with when they come to the NHL. And I can totally see Hanzig and Peltier playing together as Flames. Um, you know, so I think that if you can start building that chemistry in the American League this year, that's going to be beneficial for you as well. 
I, I yeah. agree with you though. I don't see Hanze getting reassigned or sorry, getting back in the Flames roster. I see him getting reassigned to the American League when he comes back. Not saying he won't be back in the NHL at some point this year, but I think he just right now he needs to get games. And after being out for I think he's week to week, so being out after after a couple of weeks, I think you just want him playing top minutes and the HL is where he's gonna do that. Next question here, and we talked a little bit about this earlier. I didn't want to have this discussion until now, but uh, Ryan Swanson, at 76Swanson on Twitter, who writes in with questions quite often for us, asks if the Flames make the playoffs, why can't they continue with the mindset of continuing the retool slash rebuild? And I'll answer this first, Ryan. I think they totally can. I don't think that making the playoffs this year will change Conroy's mindset. I don't think that if they make the playoffs this year, he's going to go out and sell assets or bring in a bunch more veterans or things like that. I think Conroy has a plan and he's going to go with it. And I think he will see that if they make the playoffs, it's let's call it a fluke. You know, it wasn't designed, but hey, it says we've got the right guys here. We've got guys that want to be competitive. And I think you will still see those same guys being told, go out there next year, try to be competitive. I mean, I've said this on the show a number of times. I don't believe in this, let's tank, let's tank, let's tank. I think you want to be competitive and you want those guys to be competitive. So I can see them competing for the playoffs this year. I can, but I don't think it changes anything. I don't think you'll see them make big deadline moves. I don't think that any of the pieces that are on the roster now, if they kept them for a playoff run and lost them, would be a huge deal. I mean, you know, I think Kuzmenko maybe is the top one, but I also think you're more likely to re-sign a guy like Kuzmenko if you're competitive. So I think that if they make the playoffs or not, Conroy has a three- to five-year plan, and he's going to execute it one way or the other. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, like it, he, Conroy being here when we had, like, a if – we make the playoffs this kind of a season in 14, 15, like the flames kind of, you know, like, Oh, well rebuilds over, let's go. And basically shot the team in the foot for a number of years. And then, you know, it stumbled their way eventually into being a very good team. And then, you know, everything fell apart for a couple of years. And, you know, like it, if the flames after 14, 15 had just kept on the same game plan of like, this is still a rebuild, uh, you know, playoffs that year be damned, you know, like the last handful of years probably would have turned out differently, but you know, um, like the trades for like, uh, Hamannick, for example, if they didn't go that route to like, Oh, we need to make the playoffs. You know, like, that's the kind of thing that, like, torpedoes your rebuild right there. And, you know, him being there through that experience, you know, like, I'm sure Conroy wants to win a Stanley Cup. Like, you know, uh, that's the goal, period. Everybody does. And, that's why you play the game. And we're not there yet. And, like, even, like, a year or two from now, like we still won't be there yet. We need to still work as if regardless if we're a bottom five team or in the top five in the league, like we kind of have to, you know, hedge a bit until we're, you know, like firmly cemented, like the young guys coming up are the legit, you know, carriers of this team. Like, until the, that happens where, you know, like, Zari, uh, Hanzik, Pospisil, um, you know, Coronado, like, those are your go-to guys. Like, you're, we're not there yet. And like we talked about earlier, you don't want to rush those guys just to, you know, to get to that point, right? You want those guys to develop at their pace and then hand the team over to them when they're ready. Exactly. And we don't want to kind of look, be like, okay, we need you on the roster in two years. Hopefully you figured it out. Well, and you, you've seen that, um, since 1993, that's the reason why none of the Canadian teams have won the Stanley cup. It, they don't build properly. They always, you know, take shortcuts and, you know, end up curtailing their team's future instead of letting it grow organically where teams in the U S who don't have that same pressure to all, like always be competitive, 
um they can actually do things organically let it build and you know foment properly and then you know like you see with the florida panthers like they were terrible for a long time but they were actually able to put all of the parts together and then turn those the team over to those people and you know add on when needed to get them over the top and when you mentioned yeah. Conroy being here in fourteen fifteen, he was also here in, in 21-22, and the Flames, I think, did the same thing, bringing in guys like Yarn Croak and Defoley and, you know, tried to make a run and mortgage the future for it. And, um, you know, we, he, he saw Johnny walk away, and he saw Matthew walk away, and, you know, I don't think he wants to go through that again. And talking about, you know, the rebuild and sort of not having anything, you know, any rush – I think that right now the management and the ownership are on the same page that they need to be competitive when they get their new building because they need that, you know, that revenue and that sort of thing. So I think everybody's willing to say, you know what, let's let's run the schedule that we've got. Let's keep this going so that in that new building in 2027, 20, 28 or whenever it's open, um, you know, we can, we can be competitive and we can make a long playoff run and we can hoist Lord Stanley's mug hopefully in that building sooner rather than later. Yeah, and like make us yeah. one of those dynasty teams that like the Chicago's, the Boston's, the LA's, the Pittsburgh's, that kind of thing. Yeah, and and I think that I I just get the feeling from Conroy that he's not influenced by ownership. I get the feeling that he's being he's doing things his way, and I see no reason why whether we're you know, a playoff team or not, even if the Flames somehow made it all the way to the Western Conference Final. Like, I I don't think it's going to change their outlook for next year. No. Um, and that brings us to, I guess, another question from Ryan from at 76 Swanson on Twitter. Has GM Conroy shown that he's backing up what he's been saying? So I don't know exactly what Ryan wants to know that he's been saying, but remember last year he pretty much said, um, I'm not giving anything away for free. Um, you know, he went and he made all those moves. I'm not letting anybody walk away this year. He, he said that, you know, we're not going to, we want to be competitive and even said that before free agency opened, want to be competitive. We're willing to, you know, bring in veterans. We're not willing to sign long-term deals. We heard him say before the draft that he was willing to sign two, three year deals to get through that hump. As you were saying, you know, get the team ready for the next guys, but not keep anybody on long-term. I guess when I look at Conroy, there's nothing that he said that I can blatantly come out and say he hasn't backed up what he's saying. There's only so much he can do about the on ice product and things like that. Um, you know, obviously Conroy is not out there taking the face offs and scoring the goals. But when I look at his job as GM, which is to put the right players in Flames jerseys, I think he's done that. What so Conroy needs to do, do it, what Conroy needs to do is work with Marty Pospisil teaching him all the little tick, tips and tricks on how to take face-offs so that way he can actually be an NHL center. Um, other than and that... maybe Marty doesn't want to be an NHL center. Yeah, but other than that, though, like, uh, no, Conroy to this point hasn't deviated from what he's been saying all along, so we'll see. You know, and, and even bringing in a guy like, you know, I know he got some flack when he brought in uh, Anthony Mantha, a veteran, and people saying, why do we need veterans? Like, you know, he's brought in the kind of guys that want to be here. I think, you know, even things he hasn't said, but just some of the value, like you and I talked at our draft show, we we're surprised he got value for Manjipani. We don't have to take, pay somebody to take Manjipani. Like, I think he's done exactly what he's needed to do, and he's done so far when I look at it exactly what he said his plan is going to be. And Ryan, if there's some specific you want us to talk about, let us know. But when I look at all the things he said he's going to do, they've all been done. Mm -hmm. You know, last year he went out and got some great youth, and we were talking about some of them earlier when we talked about the Wranglers. Like, you know, he backfilled some holes there. I'm I am actually surprised by how much Conroy's got done in just over a year in the job. Oh yeah, like uh, basically from having virtually no prospect pool uh, to basically being stacked to the rafters and wingers and defensemen after just one year, like that's very impressive. And you know, now it's just a matter of finding a bunch of centers and we're good to go. 
And even with all the trades he had to make last year, I thought at some point he would have got hosed. Like, I thought he would have had to make a Monaghan-like deal at some point just to move a body out. He got value on every one of those deals, you know? And we just think the tree was a good trader. But, you know, I think that Conroy, he's he's done an amazing job with the limitations he's had. And even some of the guys, you know, let's be honest, conv- you know, convincing a guy like Mantha, who I think is going to be a great guy to come here, Lomberg making those calls. I think, you know, putting those depth pieces in, not everybody can be that top line guy. Right. And I think some of the things he's decided to do, like send Peltier down, um, you know, I think are decisions that fans have maybe criticized, but it's exactly what meets his vision, in my opinion. Yeah, and... You know, bringing Hanzig up. Exactly, and making it an actual meritocracy where a guy like Hanzig, who kind of came out of nowhere, uh, like I remember us talking after the Penticton tournament going, uh, you know, is this guy going to be a bust to a couple weeks later? Hey, he's actually awesome and made the NHL team. So, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, because of and how he And even bringing played. in guys like Barry, you know, I mean... He's got some flack for Barry, but it's not that Tyson Barry's a great player you want on your team. It's that he's there to push everybody else to be better. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, you know, it gives a situation where if a guy like Miramanov's not playing well, you can throw him in there and get adequate defensive in minutes. And, you know, like if the offensive and production can... hopefully also push can, a guy like Joel Hanley, who I think yeah. is probably number eight right now. That when you get that chance, prove you're better than Tyson. Exactly. So, yeah. I, I mean, Ryan, again, if there's something specific you want us to talk about or if there's something you don't think is backing up, we'd love to hear it. Shoot us a tweet or uh, email us through our website. We'd love to chat about that. But right now, I'm I'm very happy with Conroy, again, in the limited sense of where the team is, right? Do I think Conroy is making the moves that will take them to the Stanley Cup Finals? No. Do I think that's what his job is? No. I think for where he is in his plan and what we know this team is, I think he's done a fantastic job. Yeah. Uh, he's basically in asset hoarder mode. And, you know, give me all your draft picks and I will use them. And, you know, go from there. And it's like those old Western movies where they come in and, you know, hold up the bank. Give me all your money. Exactly. All your draft picks bar- are belong to us. That's right. Well, uh, uh, except for your first this year, which we don't know who it belongs to. Yes. You can have it one might of be ours. ours but it might be Montreal's. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know who, who it belongs to or which pick it belongs to. Just somebody in the league tell us which one we're giving up. Um, you know, and I think also, yeah. Um, but I think also cleaning up some of that mess, you know, and again, he can't fix that first round pick that was done before he got here, but it feels like he's already starting to clean up some of the last guy's mess in a way. You know, I think Markstrom wanting out, that was a bit of last guy's mess. And, um, you know, I, I think that he's, he's really putting together the team that he wants it to be. And it's not like how often do you see a GM that comes in and doesn't really, especially when they were the AGM for the last guy, they kind of just follow the same vision. I give Conroy a lot of credit for coming in and putting his stamp on it, not just continuing what Trey Living did. I agree. I've been very impressed thus far, so we'll see if that continues. Yeah. Oh, and also, he said he was going to bring Jerome in, and he did. So there you go. Jerome is here. Yeah. Yeah. Though I don't think he has a full-time position this year that we all thought he would. Yeah. Given given his buddy, uh, you know, the flexibility to... Call his own game for a well, bit. I, I honestly wonder if it has something to do with I, I, I was thinking about this the other day. I wonder if, if Tej was here, he would have signed full-time. But I wonder if he doesn't want a full-time job so he can go to Utah and, you know, be with his kid and not, you know, oh, it's a Flames guy over there. Yes. That, that's possible. Like, I, I honestly wonder if that has something to do with it. Yep. Damn kids. We will. I'll try. I'll. I'll try to. I'll try to find out. But you know, I mean, he's still here. He's still around. He's still a confidant. But I can see them. Not, I can see him not want to be that employee if he's going to be over there all the time. It's sort of like when Keith Kachuk was always here, and I think he was working for the Blues at the same time. And there had to be a bit of a conflict of interest with that. Yep. 
Well, before we get to our weekly predictions, because I think we're done with the news for this week, let's remind everybody that we're two weeks away from Battle of Alberta trivia at uh, Bow River Brewing's Tap House. Matt and I will be there on the 3rd of November during the Flames-Oilers Battle of Alberta game, the second of three installments of the Battle of Alberta, hosting a Battle of Alberta trivia. We'll run one trivia game during the first intermission and one trivia game during the second intermission. There'll be prizes for winners of both, and then the winner of each of those will face off in the third period during a commercial break with one final trivia question to crown the winner of the night. And there's going to be some great prizes from us, from Bow River Brewing. we got some cool flame stuff. So we encourage you to come on out. I've had a lot of people asking me, or, you know, oh, is this going to be hard? I'm not a diehard Flames fan. The questions are going to span all the way back from 1980 to today. So there's some for every Flames fan of every Flames generation. And they're not going to be really hard questions. I'm not going to be asking you, you know, who scored the most goals randomly in 1992? Like, these are questions that are kind of general interest for all Flames fans because we want everybody to have fun. So um, minors are welcome. Bring your kids, bring your friends, bring your parents. Meet us down at Bow River Brewing on the 3rd of November. You can find more information on social media. There's a, a pinned post on our Facebook. We'll make sure that we tweet it out again and put it on Instagram. You can also find the information at firesidechat.ca. You'll see in the main navigation, Battle of Alberta Trivia. They've told us they'll have all their beers for $6 that night and all their pizzas on for 13 bucks. And I know Matt and I are both fans of their pizza, so come on out. We'd love to see you there. Put it on your calendar. It doesn't have to be a late night. Come for one intermission or both. Either way, the more you come, the more you play, the more chances you have to win. And then we'll be there watching the game between those uh, trivia games. So come hang out, chat flames with us. We had a, a really cool experience with a lot of great fans during the draft, and I hope all those people and more come out for trivia night. Yeah, it was a ton of fun last time. Uh, so... I'm looking forward to the next uh, trivia battle with everybody once again. Battle of Alberta, Battle of Trivia. It's all it's all going to be a battle on that day. And it's an yeah. early game. It's 6 p.m. game. So even on a Sunday when you got to work the next day, um, it's pretty doable. Well, Matt, with that, should we get into predictions? Yep. For once, I was correct. I'm going to give you your chance to gloat. I'm going to give you a chance to gloat because you were right. Um, last yeah. week, I thought they'd win both. You thought they'd win Chicago and lose Seattle. We know how the week went. This week, the Flames have three games in the docket, all three at home in Calgary. They play Tuesday, a 7.30 start. Those are always the weird ones for me, 7.30 starts against the Pittsburgh Penguins. Then on the 24th, the Carolina Hurricanes, a 7 p.m. start. And Hockey Night in Canada, they have the early game on Saturday with the Winnipeg Jets. So three games on tap. Uh, why don't you go first? Uh, they will beat the Penguins. That's it. And lose the other two. Yeah. As much as like as much as I want them to win all three, this is going to be I think their their toughest group of opponents yet. Yeah, like would I be shocked There's if they two teams here? Uh, you know, like if they lost the week, no, like it it could happen, but uh, yeah. It'll show a lot of what this team actually is uh, now that like teams are kind of now getting in the swing of things. I think, yeah, not only teams getting in the swing of things, but also I think now teams understanding what Calgary is. And I think part of the reason they might have won early is a little bit of underestimation. So I think that they have to beat Pittsburgh. Like Pittsburgh is not a great team this year. I think that they, they have to win in Pittsburgh. We haven't done well against the Jets lately. The Jets... I don't even know if I'd say they're a great team, but we we haven't done well against them. I think the hardest one this week is going to be Carolina. Yeah, Carolina is just very good Carolina defensively. Has a, the, well, that's it. I think they have the type of team that Calgary's not going to be able to score well against, and I think it's going to be hard to take their net. So I'm going to be optimistic. I'm going to say that they win the corners. They win uh, the 22nd, 28th. So I'm going to say they win Pittsburgh, and they win um, – Winnipeg and they lose to Carolina. Okay. It's going to be a very different story if we go from a four game win streak to a four game non win streak. Like I don't say lose. Well, I guess losing streak with um, the the uh, Seattle Overtime. game and then these three. Imagine if they're kind of yeah back to zero, essentially at the end of this. You know, back to where they started with equal wins and losses all at the end of this week. That'd be a very different story, wouldn't it? Yeah. Be like, oh, okay. Yeah, 
We are <laughs> maybe they're not as good as we thought they were. Yeah, and the top ten ish pick is actually more accurate than. Uh, but yeah, we'll we'll see. Um, it, it's a good. And test. I think I think we have to remember, like they w- they are going to struggle at some point, right? Whether now, whether later. I mean, this is you know this is not a team that's going to win three of every four. Yeah, like they're going to lose four or five in a row at some point. Or more, like it, it. Those things do happen, and and not know, just it, once in a row. I mean, I think they're going to have a couple big lo- losing streaks this year. Yeah, uh, but you know, as they sh- have shown, they can also put up a four or five game win streak too. So, um, we'll just have to wait and see, and it, just looking forward to the games as they come, and uh, hopefully, Sharon Govich can get back sooner than later, and. Uh, Rooney should be ready. I haven't heard you. anything about him. Have you? No. Nope. Um, he's not skating yet, so uh, he probably won't be ready until the Utah game at the earliest. But, uh, yeah. Because usually, they, you know, if it's like a six-week, eight-week injury, they kind of indicate that it's more like month-to-month type of thing, but not week-to-week. Um We'll see. I think th- I think these two games at the end of the week, Carolina and Winnipeg, are the ones where we're really going to figure out what this year's Flames are. And can they compete? I won't even say can they win. Can they compete against some of the good teams? And I think that's really going to be telling for us. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.